Welcome to today's webinar hosted by uh, CFA Society India. I'd like to take a moment to welcome uh, our audience, uh, you know, joining us remotely. I'm uh, Ravi Saraugi, the co-founder of uh, Samasthiti Advisors, and uh, I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Thanks a lot again for joining. So this, uh, you know, webinar was born out of a desire to commemorate the life and work of Harry Markovich, uh, who is a legendary founder of modern finance. And he lived a long and fulfilling life, uh, leaving us last month at an age of 95, uh, with a legacy which will transcend, uh, I think, many centuries. Uh, however, this webinar is not an obituary, uh, you know, uh, it's not a hagiography, it is an examination uh, of his theories. And I'm sure the speaker will not only speak about the greatness of his work, uh, but also the criticisms. And uh, I think this is exactly how Markovich would have, uh, you know, liked, uh, you know, to be remembered. Another key aspect about this webinar is that, uh, you know, we're very keen to have uh, Markovich theories examined from the perspective of the Indian markets. There is so much discussion and so much talk about. Uh, the modern finance theories, uh, you know, as applicable on the developed markets, particularly the U.S. markets, and we could not have had anyone better than today's speaker to throw light, uh, you know, on the applicability of his theories on the Indian market. So before, uh, you know, I introduce the speaker for today's webinar, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. So today's uh, webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes. Uh, the speaker will give an overview on the topic for about 25 to 30 minutes. The balance time has been allocated for Q&A. So we have a lot of time to address your queries. So please uh, keep your questions handy and please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. So you can do so by clicking on the Q&A link at the bottom of your uh, you know, viewer and you can type the questions in the box. It will be great if you could also mention your name uh, and uh, the institution that you are from. So we value your feedback. So please complete the evaluation survey before you sign off today. It's uh, you know, very important for us uh, you know, to keep improving. Uh, so it will be great to have your feedback. You can also log in to CFA Society India's website for details on past and future events. Now, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Rajan Raju, who is a veteran banker and a visiting faculty at IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, Rajan is also one of the founders of QFNR, which is a quantitative assessment tool for research and investing purposes. He uh, has a vast experience in leadership role with prestigious global banks, including Citibank, DBS, and Deutsche Bank. Presently, uh, he's the founder and director of his own single family office based out of Singapore, uh, focusing on global cross asset investment management. He has done significant amount of research. I would encourage you all to you know, Google his name on SSRN. Uh, all of his research is publicly available uh, you know, without any paywalls. A uh, lot of research on asset pricing factor theory, particularly in the Indian markets. And uh, you know it reflects his unique approach of combining practical knowledge with academic exploration in investment management. He has a passion for the intersection of finance and technology, uh, you know, which led to the establishment of QFNR. You know, that's something that you can explore as well. Uh, it, it's publicly available. Uh, Rajan is a visiting faculty member at IIM Ahmedabad, where he shares his insights and expertise in fintech in both postgraduate and executive education programs. So Rajan holds a BA in economics from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, and a PGDM from Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. On that note, let's get on with the show. Over to you, Rajan. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi. Let me just share my screen. Hopefully, you should be able to see that. Uh, I hope everybody can see that. And with that, uh, I would like to start with that. Good evening, everyone. Uh, grateful to the CFS Society and to Ravi for inviting me to give this talk in memory of Harry Markowitz. A big thanks to all of you taking Tuesday evening out to join us in this rather special discussion on an extraordinary person. 
as is always the case, uh, there is the usual disclaimer before any such discussions. I'm taking this opportunity to put it out. Uh, important part is that there is nothing here that is of, uh, that is any investment advice of any sort. In today's discussion, we'll actually cover a lot of ground. So you'll forgive me if I kind of rush you through a few uh, big blocks that Ma uh, that Markovic had laid out. So after a few preliminary uh, comments, uh, I'll start looking at the building blocks, which uh, Markovic first put out uh, back in 1952. We look at diversification, the efficient frontier, capital asset pricing model, uh, the, the low wall an uh, anomaly. Uh, then we look at things beyond CAPM, which is the factor theory, some practical use cases, specifically from an India perspective, uh, before some forward-looking concluding remarks. I've tried to capture the essence of Markowitz and the thought around the modern portfolio theory without the technical detail. I've also assumed limited familiarity with the investment jargon, so I've tried to keep this to a minimum. I've not been able to avoid it completely, but uh, I think it is fairly limited. And in the very end, I'll provide uh, links to the resources that I use for the talk. And then, of course, with Ravi and, and all of you, I, I'm really looking forward to the discussion after the, uh, the talk. Harry Markowitz was born in 1927 in Chicago and combined his life for maths and economics in a unique way, right from his early days. Uh, at the University of Chicago. An unexpected chat with the stockbroker sparked Markowitz's interest in applying mathematical methods to the stock market for his doctoral thesis. In 1952, as a PhD student, Markowitz came out with a groundbreaking paper called Portfolio Selection in the Journal of Finance. This became his PhD document and during his PhD defense, uh, Markowitz recounts Milton Friedman, another, another Nobel Prize winning economist, said, I've read your dissertation. I didn't find any flaws in it, but this is not a dissertation in economics. And we cannot give you a PhD in economics for the dis dissertation is not in economics. So Markowitz's heart sank and he continued with his defense. And after about you know, 15, 20 minutes, Friedman said, we have a problem. It is not economics. It is not mathematics. It is not business administration. Of course, Markowitz had, there was no doubt that he got his PhD. And this was all lighthearted and said in jest. But little did Markowitz know then that his doctoral, th doctoral thesis was a game changer in the world of investment management, laying the foundation of what we now call modern portfolio theory. Markowitz's contribution was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics, surprisingly, an honor he shared with Martin Miller and William Sharp in 1990. Trillions of dollars are now managed using the concepts that Markowitz traveled back in 1952. There is, a, there is thinking around investment before Markowitz and there's thinking after Markowitz. And so Markowitz was a kind of a game changer in the way we think about investments. Before him, investment analysis was focused on individual assets. But Markowitz flipped the script and suggested that we should pay more attention to how these assets interact with each other within the construct of a broader portfolio. He introduced the idea of considering the relationship between asset returns, or what is called covariances, a radical shift in the approach that altered our understanding of risk and return trade-offs. His theory provided a mathematical structure that redefined how investors perceive risk and return trade-offs. At the heart of modern portfolio theory is an age-old wisdom called diversification. Markowitz added a mathematical twist to the don't put all your eggs in one basket adage, which has actually been with, with humans since the age of the Talmud. What Markowitz showed was that risk stems not just from individual assets, but from how they behave together. By mixing assets with different risk return features and correlations, we can create a portfolio that gives us the most bang for our buck, given a certain level of risk. While returns are additive across instruments, 
risk as a measure of volatility of returns was a function of covariance rather than adding individual volatilities. That risk and return kind of went into a fundamental tug of war. And Markowitz being a rationalist believed that all investors want maximum returns for minimum risk. But higher returns usually come with higher risk. So what is the sweet spot? And this became the famous efficient frontier. This concept refers to a set of portfolios that offers the highest return for the particular risk level or the lowest risk for a particular return level. And as we'll see later, the efficient frontier has a unique bullet-like shape of this frontier that comes about because of the correlation between assets. Markowitz suggested that we should aim for portfolios on this efficient frontier to get the most return for the risk we're willing to take. This groundbreaking idea changed how we manage investments, shifting our focus solely from returns to a dual consideration of risk and return, laying the foundation of what we know today as modern portfolio management. Markowitz also wrote another paper titled The Utility of Wealth in 1952, arguing that changes in wealth, not wealth itself, influence our behavior. This notion predates and informs the field of behavioral finance. So not only is Markowitz known as the father of portfolio theory, but he also humorously called himself the grandfather of behavioral finance. Many thinkers added to the, their unique flavors based on Markowitz's similar ideas. A notable name is William Sharp. Yes, the same person who got the whole Nobel Prize along with Markowitz, who evolved Markowitz's theory and gave us capital asset pricing model, or CAPM. CAPM lets us determine an investment's expected return based upon the uh, return uh, based upon the expectation of taking systemic risk, a concept popularly known as beta. Put another way, beta gauges the sensitivity of, the sec of a security's returns to the overall market. It is critical to differentiate between systemic risk, which affects all securities, and idiosyncratic risk that is unique to each security. The security market line, another cap and brainchild, illustrates the links between the security's expected return and its beta. Capum's brilliance lies in providing a new framework for valuing risky securities and computing the cost of capital. It also quantified something called equity risk premium. The extra return above the risk-free rate that investors demand to, to get to take on the additional equity risk that they're taking on. This premium, represents compensation for systemic risk intrinsic to equities as a whole, while idiosyncratic or firm-specific risks can be diversified away. Again, coming back to diversification. While capital was a giant leap, it wasn't without its critics. Its simplicity was both its strength and its weakness. While elegant, it failed to account for real-world complexities and could not explain specific observations known as anomalies. For example, Capum struggles with value investing, where portfolios of cheaper firms tend to outperform those of more expensive firms. This led to further advancements in the model, like the Farmer French three-factor model, which suggested that firm size and book-to-market ratios also systematically impact stock returns. Pharma French later expanded this to a five-factor model, adding profitability and investment factors. The factor revolution fueled the growth of the smart beta or factor style industry, giving investors a new way to diversify and construct portfolios. The behavioral school also chipped in enriching our understanding of, be of behavior and asset prices. Modern finance today is a fascinating blend of many disciplines, all thanks to the exciting journey initiated by markets. While these models were initially conceived and tested in developed markets, they've also found a place in emerging markets. 
the unique dynamics of these emerging markets, especially in the assumption of efficient markets, present both challenges and opportunities for these models. Modern portfolio theory has its critics. Charlie Munger famously slammed the idea of extensive diversification, calling it diversification. The theory also faces flag for its perceived Western bias, while some arguing it does not work in emerging markets. So to check this out from an Indian context, let's swap the peaceful academic halls of Nobel laureates for the hustle and bustle of India's stock market. So let's start with diversification. Investment titans like Buffett and Munger might favor concentrated portfolios, but for the average investor, smart diversification remains the market's only free lunch. Buffett has said that in his will, he instructs that 90% of the cash his family receives upon his death be invested in a low cost S&P 500 fund and the other 10% in short-term government bonds. Echoes of diversification? I think so. Now, from an Indian perspective, uh, I co-authored a paper in 2021 with Professor Subesh Agarwala, and we used the Nifty 500 stocks to show that idiosyncratic risk drops as one adds more stocks to the portfolio. In this case, we added from one to 500 stocks in a portfolio and then looked at how risk as defined by the volatility of the portfolio changed. What we did was we created random portfolios. You know, there were 1,000 or 10,000 random portfolios that we created. And then we looked at averages of, of, the, of the volatilities of those portfolios. So the left panel shows how quickly the idiosyncratic risk drops in the initial period. And then by the time it comes to 500, you, know, you take all 500 uh, stocks and put them into the portfolio, everything is pretty much as low as it can be. The right panel shows the same reduction in risk, but from one to 100. As you can see, there's a, star, there's a really sharp fall down until 10, and then it starts to flatten out somewhere starting to come to about 40 or 50. Uh, before it becomes, uh, you know, every additional stock that you add kind of adds very little. Content. What we found is that the devil is in the detail. And using averages for portfolio assessment can obscure crucial data. In India, there's this kind of myth that if you had 15 to 20 you know, stocks in your portfolio, you're actually a diversified portfolio. The reality and solution I found, and we proposed a framework to determine the number of stocks needed in a portfolio to give the user a specific confidence level that they have reduced the risk by X amount. So in this particular case, uh, we feel it takes about between 40 to 50 stocks in an evenly distributed portfolio to reduce the risk by 90% with 90% confidence. But remember, there is no one size that fits all here. We can take diversification and take it across the nation, uh, across geographies. Investing abroad has been a source of big debate in the role of home biased portfolios. In a recent study, I showed that Indian investors could boost their portfolio outcomes by reducing the heavy home bias in their investment. Here, instead of volatility, I used worst case returns to measure diversification benefits. This is a more intuitive approach towards risk, especially for those who are not well versed with uh, modern portfolio theory. There are two common criticisms of diversification. One, are, one is that high correlation of assets during crisis. Something like the umbrellas disappear when you need it most, when it is raining. And the second one is most of modern portfolio theory assumes a normal dis return distribution. Whereas actually the reality is that return distributions are the fat tails and with, with a lot of skewness, which means that they are either left side or right, right side biased. By employ employing some statistical tools to address these challenges, 
I demonstrate that carefully selected exposure to international markets can significantly improve worst case outcomes for portfolios in the long run, despite short-term drawdowns. The graphic in this chart shows four portfolios, uh, one which is uh, where the international exposure is set from 0, 10, 25, and 50. The exposures for international are developed markets, emerging markets, Asia, and all country world index. And then what you will see is that in every case, until about five years, you are going to have drawdowns. Worst case drawdowns still remain. But then as you look at it over a 10 year horizon, suddenly the worst case drawdown, if I was to look at the all country, is significantly higher than having just a domestic portfolio almost twice as better. So clearly having the international diversification uh, means, and it comes back down to the principles of covariances matter. Because if you had an emerging market portfolio, which, which varies very similarly to India, there is almost no diversification benefits because you can see that there, all the four curves are very close to one another. So covariances matter. Now, one takeaway from this slide, diversification, like anything else, needs time and patience, but it works. There's also solid evidence backing the idea of an efficient frontier in Indian equities. In this particular chart, I show total returns from various Nifty indices, Nifty 50, Nifty, the next 50, the mid cap 150, and the small cap. And I show in terms of the dots what their historical risk return portfolios are, or uh, characteristics are. The small gray, uh, the small green and blue dots that you see are random portfolios comprised of uh, that are made up from one of these four or all of these. Four. And what you'll find is that there is a line, a bullet-shaped line that draws between the diamond, which is there at the lowest level of volatility and the round red circle of the mid cap 150, which is the highest level of return, there is a set of lines, which investors can align their risk preferences along this, this particular frontier, maximizing returns for the variance that they are comfortable with. You can use these same principles also for international portfolios. Here, Again, in that paper that I did on international diversification, I show a range of historical risk return characteristics of markets. And once again, there is an efficient frontier that comes across. The tricky part isn't the math, but coming up with reliable, real world estimates of future returns and covariances. There are lots of technical tools available for us. And when used right, they do lead to robust portfolios solving investor objectives. A word of caution, historical time series are backward looking and might not reflect what is going to come. People like Black and Glitterman devised very clever ways to blend historical time series with forward projections to calculate covariance between assets. And these are used globally to manage again, very large sums of assets. Of course, the question is, how much can you trust these forward projections? That depends upon your understanding of the mathematics that goes behind these forward assumptions. A simpler approach? Well, history may not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So historical data is often a good starting point to building a portfolio. It also allows you to say how you can move from using just pure modern portfolio theory principles towards some of your own biases. And that's a perfectly good way or as good a way as anything else. Now there's a curious contradiction in CAPM known as the low risk anomaly. According to CAPM, there should be a linear relationship between risk returns and risk. More the risk, the higher the expected return. But like international research, my research in India covering about 4,400 firms from 2004 onwards reveals that the low risk anomaly is very alive within the Indian context. 
the graph here shows whether we consider beta realized volatility historical or idiosyncratic volatility this is a volatility where you take out any systematic effects and then whatever is left becomes a idiosyncratic volatility to sort stocks into 10 decides the returns follow a convex curve not a straight line whether you use equal weighted decile portfolios or market weighted decile portfolios. This suggests a low risk anomaly works in Indian stocks, no matter how we measure risk or how we weight portfolios. Does this mean that CAPM has failed? I don't think so. The low risk anomaly could indicate economic factors like post unis risk premium or investor constraints, including borrowing, leverage, and short selling limits. Certain behavioral biases, such as overconfidence and a lottery preference, as well as agency issues like fund, manage, fund manager behavior concerning benchmarks and relative performance priority may also contribute to this. Now an ideal asset pricing model should be able to explain all expected returns resulting in a zero leftover return or alpha when the portfolio's excess returns are regressed against the asset pricing model's factor risk returns. Our CAPM was falling short consistently, explaining expected returns across various portfolios. With anomalies like size and low risk, CAPM needed an upgrade. That's where Pharma and French came with their three and five, four, five factor models adding a new dimension to, to capital. In the three-factor version, they added size and value as factors to the market factor. Using an ingenious methodology to separate the effects of the market and size factors. Subsequently, they added profitability and investment factors, creating the five-factor model. Momentum is another very popular factor. While new factors are cons constantly being discovered, one should be wary of the growing factor zoo. Empirical factor models without robust umbrella theories tend to vanish very quickly. Despite the flavor of the bulk connotation that factors suffer from in popular investing, academic theory says that factors earn premiums over lo the long term because they, sh they suffer short or medium term pain. I wanted to see if the five factor model really worked in India. So I use the pharma French method for Indian equities, adapting it to fit India's financial year ending in March. The US financial year is December, ours is in March, therefore our portfolio construction periods are actually different. However, using the pharma French factory definitions, I used a large survival bias free universe of fame, uh, firms, making this a unique study in India and comparable with other international data sets. All factor portfolios in my study were well diversified, minimizing the chances of idiosyncratic portfolio risk throughout the period, resulting in robust estimates of factor returns. The chart shows the progress of these five factors over time. The data library, pharma French factors, momentum, and low risk factors for the Indian market, where the underlying data is taken from is updated monthly and is publicly available for researchers and practitioners. Notably, the data set accurately reflects the top heavy nature of the Indian equity markets by defining breakpoints by the firms categorized as big, which account for the top 90% of the market cap, focusing on the most liquid part of the market and minimizing sample factor signal noises from smaller, less liquid firms. Beside the long short factor returns, the data library provides returns for sub portfolios that constitute the market neutral factors, making it a valuable resource for practitioners and academics. One comment that deserves to be made, factors are empirical and are therefore specific to the domain. One should be careful of directly using results from international equities to Indian equities. Admittedly, the data for Indian equities is barely two decades long compared to the almost 100 years time series in the US. But it's a bit like looking for a ring lost on road under a street lamp. Or the weaker light from a torch might be more helpful 
in the Indian context, the 20 year time series is well worth using, flaws and all, rather than ignoring it. Which factor model should one choose? Capital, Pharma, French 3 or 5 factors? I tested all three of them, them on their ability to explain portfolio prices and found that none of them fully explained expected returns, just like Pharma and French found with their factor data set for US data. The test requires several well diversified portfolios, each with distinct characteristics, so as to minimize the effects of specific risk. For example, a fully market portfolio devoid, devoid of any residual characteristics should ideally have its returns 100% explained by the market factor. Similarly, the returns of a portfolio composed of value stocks should be explained fully by the value and market factor. The five-factor model consistently comes out on top of the three models, suggesting that it is better at capturing market com complexity. Instead of getting lost in the technical details of the power test, look at this chart. It just shows the pharma French models explain better, or better explain the expected returns of portfolios than capital by almost 10 percentage points. Here I've used the goodness of fit coming out from the regressions and just saying which, which regression does a better job. Remember asset pricing models primarily serve to explain and understand factors that influence returns. Assets are bundles of factors, each of which, which defines a set of bad times for the average investor. In a crude sense, factors are to assets what nutrients are to food. Each type of food is a bundle of nutrients. Most foods contain more than just one nutrient. For instance, dal will have both carbohydrates and protein. It is the nutrients that give sustenance. And what when we eat food, we get the nutrients inherent, not just for the food itself, no matter how good it tastes. And different people have different nutrient requirements. In fact, the same person will have different nutrient requirements depending on their stage in life very similar to investing. For the long run, investors exposed to factors earn higher returns on average because during bad times, the factors will underperform, sometimes dramatically. Factor premiums also result from behavior of investors that is not arbitrage. Really. Now, investment managers, think of them as the chefs, can pull three main levers for returns, asset allocation, stock selection, and timing scale. While marketing materials often detail the strategy and its expected alpha source, returns can be deconstructed into their underlying factors to understand the drivers of these returns. Such an analysis can reveal whether an investment remains true to its strong. Now, Markowitz's theories, as I've hopefully have shown, are relevant within Indian, uh, within Indian equities. How can asset owners, managers, and advisors harness these insights to inform more effective evidence-based decisions? Are there tools in India that encapsulate the robust framework of the MPT, offering valuable insights without requiring extensive coding expertise or a computing degree? One such platform is QFINAR, where I am a co-founder. QFINAR is an intuitive investment analyst analytics platform designed for both individual investors and wealth managers, providing a su suite of sophisticated mathematical tools wrapped in an easy to use visual user experience to manage, organize, and evaluate financial investments. Users can import, create, and analyze portfolios, stress test their investments, and discover new opportunities. For investors, it serves as a personal investment analyst, while for wealth managers, it automates routine tasks and enhances client engagement through analytics. QFNR simplifies complex investment concepts into easy to understand graphics, making it an essential tool for the investment planning and analysis. For the first illustration of the practical use of MPT, we look at four strategies, <clears throat> which aim to systematically harvest the value premium among small cap firms in India. All these four strategies are available on small case. A popular investment platform in India, which allows numerous boutique investment professionals to showcase their strategies. Many of these strategies are systematic, 
factor style based and often target small cap stocks. I've analyzed a sample of these strategies available on the platform for at least three years of returns in a paper earlier this year. For today, in the chart that I'm just going to show you, I've shown QFINAR's analysis of four strategies that aim to, that aim to exploit the value premium. What QFNR does is it employs multiple regressions using long short and long only factor returns to break down factor exposures into market, which is on the extreme left, size, value, quality, and momentum factors. Quality combines profitability and investment factors. This approach accounts for the short selling constraints prevalent in the Indian markets. And then the statistical results that come out are translated into these intuitive graphics that present exposures visually. The red line kind of gives a demarcation mark. So uh, things that on the market factor, in the market uh, column, anything below the red line are lower beta, anything above the red line are higher beta. By examining monthly returns of these four strategies, value strategies from 2019, it is evident that while small size tilt is very clear. As you can see, all the four are towards the bottom of the size uh, column. Value does not seem to be in evidence because all of them are neutral. Interestingly, all the managers seem to have a slight quality bias, which is a combination, as I said, of investment and profitability factors. A second version of this is to scrutinize the factor exposures of five large popular, uh, five popular large and mid-cap schemes to highlight differences in the respective fund manager's factors. Normally a fund manager would say I'm large and mid-cap plus I've got uh, some exposure towards some style. By using QFNR's analytics, we're able to see where the differences come up. And here it is clear to see that some fund managers are slightly higher in beta, others are slightly lower. Some have got a bias towards smaller size. Some are more focused on the larger size. One seems to have a momentum factor built into their strategy. A savvy asset owner understanding these variations could now design an efficient portfolio that aligns her target risk level by diversifying across these funds and their differing factor styles. Now, financial advisors, money managers, and academics utilize style analysis to purchase, classify, or construct investments and to monitor them for what is called style data. There are two main approaches for style analysis. One is a holdings-based, and the second is a returns-based. The holding-based style tools classify portfolios based upon the characteristics of the underlying securities, an approach that is widely adopted in India. Conversely, returns-based styled analysis, RBSA, compares portfolio returns from, you know, they usually take between three to five years of monthly returns uh, to the returns of various style-based indices. And it draws inferences about style based upon how closely the portfolio mirrors the returns of these indices. Both approaches are helpful in understanding portfolio performance. QFNR uses six styles, varying from large cap through to low volatility. And each of them are, uh, uses a low cost tracker, ETF, or a fund to serve as, serve as style proxies. Now, in the next slide, I show you two large cap funds with their rolling style based analysis. Now, managers who are who maintain a consistent strategy will demonstrate a relatively stable exposure over time. On the other hand, active managers will switch actively between and dynamically between styles to outperform the chosen benefit. Using RBSA, our discerning investor can gain deeper insight into how the fund manager thinks, offering yet another dimension for diversification based on management styles. Using MPT, it is easy to uncover drivers of returns and then use this insight to build and manage more effective targeted portfolio solutions. Markowitz's critical insight was to position the portfolio at the center of the analysis. 
Similarly, portfolios the heart uh, are at the heart of QCNR rather than individual assets. And the platform uses the Markowitz risk return framework delivering a graphical representation of a portfolio's unique characteristics, including its factor exposure. With Harish Krishnan, one of your CFA alumni, uh, I examined factor exposures of popular strategy indices in India. We suggested a framework seen in this chart that looks at full factor regressions, RBSAs, isolating of factors, and then triangulating to arrive at conclusions. You will note it is a framework that I just discussed and one that QFNR has adopted. For asset managers, MPT provides a range of levers to build strategies and solutions. I worked with Anish Telly on applying the conservative formula in the Indian context and exploring long only factor style portfolios. Both papers offer insights into using ideas that began in Markowitz into portfolios of Indian equities that go beyond the usual size classification. Further, I investigated the impact of varying the universe of stocks and the number of holdings for momentum portfolios. And I concluded that there is a significant opportunity for craftsmanship alpha. This is where the way the fund manager executes delivers alpha in the Indian context. Employing elements of MPT to refine or explain the strategy's outcomes should be readily a readily achievable goal that can elevate the disclosure requirements as well as discussion for solutions. While this practice is relatively common in developed markets, it is encouraging to see that early signs of its adoption by industry participants in India, more needs to be done. MPT and Kapamandir extensions are certainly cornerstones of financial theory. But like many models, they rest on the series of assumptions, some of which have been critically challenged. First, these models assume investors are rational and aim to maximize their utility. In reality, however, investment behavior is far from rational, influenced by cognitive bases and emotions. Even Markowitz, faced with a choice between bonds and stocks in 1952, chose a 50-50 spread, not based on his portfolio theory, but rather to minimize his potential regret. However, today, seven decades on, trillions of dollars globally are managed using MPT, and these account for behavioral biases and preferences. Second, models are single period investment horizons, treating investments as isolated events rather than an ongoing practice. In reality, investment is a continual process with frequent portfolio adjustments. There are multi-period uh, analytical techniques that are available for the specialized user. They do involve complex mathematics, but the models and frameworks are continuing, continually being refined and simplified. Third, models largely disregard real-world fictions like taxes, transaction costs, and borrowing limitations. It can significantly influence investment decision and portfolio construction. But this is easily addressed, and investors and advisors should be capable of estimating real-world costs for their specific circumstances. Model risk is a reality of finance professions. Regular stress testing of models is crucial and allowances should be factored into model outcomes. Investor preferences, underlying strategies, time horizons, liquidity, and regulator or exchange constraints are among the several, several variables that one needs to consider. In the Indian context, liquidity plays a particularly important role given India's top heavy market and liquidity stock. Strategies involving firms outside the top 100 by market capitalization must incorporate liquidity risk. Lack of liquidity also implies capacity constraints. Will the current crowding of factor strategy funds and ETFs in the top 200 by market capitalization affect usual market behavior? 
This chart from a paper that Harish and I wrote shows that the monthly median number of stocks that can trade 50 crores in a day, assuming a 25% participation for a 2000 crore index tracker fund before impact costs affect bid and ask spreads. As you can see, it's only about 80. It is clear that liquidity needs to be accounted for. Innovative trading strategies, higher tracking errors during rebalancing periods, and an increased actively managed component will be some of the strategies that fund managers will need to employ to address liquidity. I would submit that liquidity and consequently capacity constraints are inherent in the Indian market structure and therefore should be treated as an integral part of MPT. While traditional finance theories provide for essential frameworks to understand investment management, the discipline continues to evolve, incorporating new perspectives and methodologies. One such development is the growing recognition of behavioral economics. In contrast to traditional economics of investor rationality, behavioral finance acknowledges that investors often act based on biases and heuristics, leading to decisions that deviate from rational predictions. Similarly, theories like the adaptive market hypothesis propose that market efficiency is in static, but evolves, influenced by environment conditions, the number of market part participants, and other factors. This view reconciles efficient markets with investor irrationality by suggesting that markets are at times efficient and are at other times not contingent on varying circumstances. In the future too, investment management will continue to evolve influenced by advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning. These technologies analyze vast and complex data sets, potentially generating new investment insights. Low cost computing, access to data sets and easy to use tools, open source libraries and programming languages are rapidly making quantitative investment available for the common person. Additionally, the integration of environment social and governance factors, ESGs, and the use of alternative data is gaining momentum, providing new dimensions for portfolio construction risk. As we navigate the ever-evolving finance and investment landscape, we must maintain Markowitz's curiosity and drive to understand portfolio risks. The current reshaping of the financial services industry reflects its contributions, NPT and behavior. Investors want their portfolio to satisfy psychological needs in addition to returns. By incorporating critical principles from, the, from MPT, the industry can develop efficient solutions, if not in the narrow sense of the mean variance model that he proposed. The achievement of these two tasks will give Markowitz a great legacy, much more crucial than one based on MPT alone. Don't get me wrong. My point is not that MPT is the right or only framework. The investment industry is ever evolving and needs a multi-framework approach to build robust solutions for investment companies. Remember, theories are abstractions of reality. They help us understand reality, but they're not reality itself. As Markowitz has provided, a handy abstraction applicable even in the Indian context. His thoughts supplement other frameworks and heuristics in the use of the, in the invest, investment industry currently. Let's use them all profitability. With that, I welcome any thoughts and suggestions that you may have. Back to you, Ravi. Thanks a lot, uh, you know, Rajan. I appreciate uh, you know you taking out time and. Uh, going through all the slides in a lot of detail. We are running slightly short of time. So what I'll, and of course I had many questions for you, but uh, what I'll do is I'll prioritize the audience Q&A. And of course I can always uh, you know, probably catch you post the session as well. So we have, uh, you know, a fair set of questions. Uh, you know, everybody I would, uh, you know, anybody who wants to ask a question, you can please uh, you know, go to the Q&A box. So we have a question from Shanto Ganguly, who is a quantitative researcher in Morningstar. And his question is, uh, just wanted to understand the regression setup 
are you regressing the returns of the funds you gave as examples against the long short portfolio returns uh, and is high exposure to a specific factor is it based on the absolute value of the coefficient from that regression setup excellent questions uh, uh... I'm slightly technical, so I'll try and kind of back off on the technical part, if you don't mind. So they do use both a long short as well as the, the long only, because uh, in India, there's this unique circumstance that we have where there are short selling constraints. And uh, the final output that QFNR gives is a kind of a mixture uh, uh, of both those, reg uh, both those re regressions. The second part, uh, which is uh, how, do, how do we kind of classify it? We do actually run on a regular basis uh, the various coefficients, factor coefficients across the industry, across all the funds. And that then helps us set, set out some benchmarks. And once we have those benchmarks, then we kind of calibrate the model, which then gets, uh, which then gets reflected in the output. So that if you're looking at really high size uh, uh, exposures, it means across all the universe of funds that, that, we are, that QFNR has got, this particular fund does stand out. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, I'll move on to the next uh, you know, question. This is uh, my personal favorite as well. This question is from uh, Vinay Basavaraj, who is a member at the CFA Society India. And he asks uh, about the low risk anomaly. And uh, his question is, are you suggesting that returns fall after a certain point of high risk? In a excellent question. Actually, I'm not suggesting it. That's what the evidence says. Uh, so the, the approach there is you take, you take portfolios, uh, you, know, you can do it on a cross section, and you take all the stocks, classify them in your favored uh, measure of risk, whatever measure of risk you use. I use beta, uh, both ex ante as well as realized beta. I used realized volatility and I used idiosyncratic volatility. In all cases, uh, you would rank the portfolios starting from the highest risk down to the lowest risk. And so when you then look at returns for each of those, you know, the portfolio returns that you get, you'll find that after a certain point, uh, returns do tend to drop even though you're taking higher risk. There are some really, uh, there are some strong theories around this. So there are some underlying rational theories, behavioral theories, as well as agency theories that are available. Uh, and I would suggest that, you know, uh, the paper that I, I have put out is, is for India. But the, the pioneering work in this was done by David Blitz, Ben Van, Van Fleet, and others at Roboco. Fisher Black actually found this uh, early on when he found that the the, the the security market line was more flat than what was what was predicted by cap so so this is a this is a quite a uh, uh, it's quite a well known anomaly uh, and it is one of those that uh, cause people to start to think about how how to get better than what cap does i'll move on to the next question this is from an anonymous attendee uh, Thanking you for he or she is thanking you for the presentation and an efficient frontier of India and USA uh, or say the international markets would result in higher allocation in uh, the international markets as it has a lower standard uh, you know lower uh, I, I'm assuming that is standard deviation compared to India and thereby having a higher weightage. Can I have constraints to have a maximum, you know, 30 international portfolios and create an efficient frontier? Absolutely. So, so having additional constraints to create an efficient frontier has been, has been around for a while. And so uh, there are multiple constraints that you could have. It just doesn't have to be only on weights. You could actually put in uh, other kinds of constraints as well. Uh, we, uh, I also have some questions, uh, you know, which some people put in before the webinar itself, uh, you know, they had reached out. So this one is from Jyoti Prakash. So he's, he's, he's asking, is there an optimal look back period uh, when we are doing computation for risk return covariance? Is data for 10 years adequate? And I, and I think this is a very important question because for all the budding, uh, you know, quant professionals who want to do 
this kind of research on the Indian markets. We often, uh, our financial markets are young. You highlighted that, you know, 20 years of data versus 100 years of data in the US. So maybe you could share your challenges uh, and what's the kind of uh, look back period that you use generally. Well, it's an excellent question. Uh, and I, I, I don't think that there is, there is a, a, a sim simple answer for it. Uh, I think your your uh, the look back period also depends upon what is it that you're trying to solve for. So if you're looking at at broad asset classes rather than narrow asset classes, uh, and you assume that mean reversion does happen across broader asset classes, uh, then the longer the look back, ten years should be okay. You would actually get data that goes back even even more from possibly twenty years or twenty five years in, in in the Indian context. If you are looking at something that has got a much shorter time horizon, so your investment horizon is also going to be very quick, then you will have to start to use uh, other techniques. It could be shorter periods of look back. It could be exponential weighted uh, uh, processes to, uh, to get averages. So you give more weightage to the, 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 the more recent, uh, the more recent returns, or you use the black Letterman approach to allow for historical returns plus the forward-looking returns based upon your, either your perspective or a, or a consensus of uh, investment officer's perspective or economist's perspective. And that then will get you a way to kind of mix historical returns with forward-looking returns. Uh, but in all these cases, I would just caution that these are these are models which give you a great baseline. And as you think about moving from that baseline to what your specific objective are, there could be further steps that you'll have to do. So that's why I say often starting with a historical historical return for 10 years, if you're doing it at an asset level, actually is not a bad place to be in. Okay, we have uh, you know another question from Aditya Ajit Padman, uh, Padman, I guess, member from CFA Society India. Uh, he asks, uh, why haven't quant funds been able to deliver alpha in India? Uh, you know, but he has not uh, specified what data he's referring to. But you can use it as a general question, and and maybe I can add uh, you know one aspect to this question. So there is you know managers who do fundamental research, uh, you know, Graham Dodd style, yeah. uh, were completely oblivious to the research that you are showing. In fact, you mentioned that, you know, in your presentation that Charlie Munger would say the diversification of 50 would be diversification. So so it, it looks like, you know, there's this two, uh, you know, camps. Uh, what's your view on this? Will, will they ever meet or, or do you feel they have come together more or or, or you think it's, it's it's more split over the years what's your sense on uh, excellent question again so so i think this is a problem in the past where there were very strong camps you know you guys in quant don't do anything and the guys in quant say you guys in fundamentals don't know anything and i think as both both frameworks have developed because there's been a lot of development even in the fundamental side. And a lot of those fundamental work has now transferred themselves into modern portfolio theory in terms of constructing portfolios, understanding how those come about. The key challenge is that there are always going to be some really skilled players. So, you know, you will always get a Tendulkar. There will be a Tendulkar for a generation. And without question, that person has got some unique insights to say why his or her way of doing stuff is going to be unique. And then there's a bunch of journeymen. To the bunch of journeymen, there's always going to be, how do I do it? Some, how do I make portfolios that are robust for me? Right? And for that, using a mixture of quant plus fundamental, I think is the way to go forward. The challenge has also been a lot of the fundamental approaches have been cloaked in mystery in the past. But then as you got some excellent books that are starting to come out, including, you know, if I go back to the intelligent investor, there is some really clear ways of how you can now take those insights and start to create portfolios and see, can I make a difference? So the academic factor process of saying, I'm going to take uh, price to book as my value coefficient 
or my value metric is only one. Is it right? I don't think so. Is it wrong? Again, I don't think so. It gives you a baseline. There are other studies that have got multiple metrics to say this is value. So in my mind, I think there is a closer, there, these things will start to get closer and closer as time evolves and more people understand on, on both sides. So, so that, that would be my, my two cents. I, I do think that you know, with the growing computer literacy that is happening across the generations, uh, our next generation will be a lot more savvy about computers and data than we are. And the generation after that will be even more savvy. Uh, and things like you know, artificial intelligence and all will just help make things more, more efficient. It does mean alpha will be more difficult to generate. <laughs> Okay, we have, uh, uh, maybe we're running short of time. So maybe, you know, I'll have one more question. Uh, you know, and this is again from Jyoti Prakash. Uh, how do you handle correlations break in the short term? Uh, for example, all asset classes provided negative returns in 2022. On the contrary, all asset classes are providing positive return in 2023. But what's the best way to deal with circumstances like these? Excellent question. Uh, the, the only uh, my only response to that is uh, you know again what I showed in the international diversity education uh, paper it works in the long run in the short run expect to have drawdowns so often if you get in there with the perception that diversification means you'll never have a drawdown your expectation is wrong because that's not what the evidence has shown the evidence does show that diversification in times of crisis disappears. So you need to build portfolios that deal with it. In the long run, if you have the right amount of, uh, if you build the right ingredients, you will benefit in the sense of you will have better worst case returns. You will have lower stress in the portfolio. You're likely to deliver more consistently to what you thought you would deliver to your expected returns. So there's a whole range of, of benefits of diversification, but it works eventually. Perfect. Okay. Great. So, uh, uh, Ravi, can I apologize for the time because uh, there yes. was a lot to cover, and you know, I, I tried my best to kind of rush along, but I felt if I rushed along, it may not uh, it may not meet the objective as well. So, my apologies to everyone in terms of taking extra time, um, but always happy to answer any questions. I think uh, you know we have covered quite a bit, uh, and uh, you know, I'll I'll, I'll uh, I, I, I just have one, you know, there's a person who is asking, can you please share the links to the paper? So all of uh, Rajin's papers, including all the research that he showed, is publicly available. So please Google him. Uh, his papers are available in SSRN network. Rajan, you would like to add something? Uh, I can just share a screen. Uh, what, what you could do is, uh, let me just do that, please. Sorry, I don't think I've shared the right screen. Did you have a look at that? No, we are seeing something else. Just a second. Let me try that again. Uh, you still can't see the big, big this thing? You're seeing no. something small, right? Wait, just a second. Let me try. Uh, but just, just a note for the audience, his papers are available at uh, SSRN Network. So you can just type SSRN Rajan Raju and uh, that's uh, yeah. and you can download all of his uh, you know research. Great. So uh, I think I think that 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 may be the best way to do. Yes. So thank you, thank you so much, you know, Rajan, for you know sharing your insights with us today. Really appreciate you taking out time for this, uh, you know, and uh, thank you to the audience for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we hope you found it useful and look forward to having all of you again in a subsequent, uh, you know, webinar. Thank you again. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you to the team at uh, at the CBS Society.